It's official, the Sacramento Kings have won the league championship. 70 years ago they did. Check it out. Another episode of the Royal Report with Calvin and Barry, a Sacramento Kings sports talk show. Some great news this week for the Sacramento Kings. Rashawn Holmes and Marvin Bagley have both been cleared for basketball activities, and we anticipate both of them rejoining the team on the court in the next few days or so. I want to do a quick shout out to my Sacramento Kings fans out there. Make sure you hit that like and subscribe button. If you are a Kings fan, you love talking about the Kings, make sure you stay tuned to our channel. We do have a new episode every Friday dropping just for Kings fans. That's right. Thank you as always out there for watching. On this week's episode of the Royal Report, Barry and I will play a game of Kings Fair or Foul. We'll remember one of the happiest days in the history of the Kings organization as the anniversary was hit this week. And we have our second ever special guest on the Royal Report this week, Sacktown Pete will drop by to talk about De'Aaron Fox and the season that he's having in Sacramento. But first, as always, we'll begin with some highlights from around the league. There are a couple of hot teams in the NBA and the Golden State Warriors are one of them. There was a time earlier this season where you would have thought the chances the Warriors would make the playoffs was absolutely zero. Then Steph Curry told the NBA world to hold his beer. Steph has just completed one of the best 10 game stretches perhaps in NBA history, at least from an offensive standpoint. Prior to Wednesday's game, where Steph came back down to earth against the Wizards, he was putting up ridiculous numbers. He's now leading the NBA in points per game, and in that 10 game stretch, he had 11 games actually of scoring 30 or more points, which is the most ever by a player 33 years or older. He hit a staggering 72 threes in those 10 games, obviously the most ever. And Steph now has six games this season alone of 10 or more threes. And if you remember correctly from a previous episode, the next closest person in NBA history only has five for his career. It's just ridiculous what Steph is out there doing right now. And he single-handedly has the Warriors in the playoff picture. Another team and another player that is making some big moves and very, very hot right now in the league are the New York Knicks and Julius Randle. The Knicks have seemed to completely cement their playoff positioning in the Eastern Conference. They have not lost a game since April 7th, winning eight in a row and climbing all the way to the fourth seed, which would be a home playoff series in the first round of the Eastern Conference. Julius Randle continues to have a breakout season. He is averaging 24 points, 10 and a half rebounds, over six assists, one steal per game while shooting 41% from three. Julius has not had a season in his career where he shot better than 34% from three until this season. Barry, it seems that those stats combined with a healthy addition of Derrick Rose and one of the league's best defenses I mean, we could see this team playing into the second round of the playoffs this year. Yeah, it's pretty amazing what uh, Tom Thibodeau has, has done with that team. It just goes to show what great coaching can do for a franchise. They continue to get better every single week, and it is amazing to see them in the playoffs. I know LeBron uh, was on record this week saying that the, the NBA is just better when the Knicks are good and competitive. So. Happy to see them uh, still in that playoff race. I wanna to get to some somber news here in the NBA. There has been some injuries around the league, or as we say on this show, injury, injury, injury. Uh, Denny Ad, uh, Abdia 
has actually has a hairline fracture in his ankle. He will most likely miss uh, the rest of the season. Also, Trey Young is dealing with a grade two left ankle sprain. He will also be sidelined for some time. Good news on the injury front, uh, Anthony Davis has returned to action. Uh, he started last night against the Mavericks for the Lakers in a productive outing. It's good to see him back after missing the last 30 games uh, dealing with uh, injuries. On another note, Paul George continues his redemption tour, shooting an absurd 43% from three-point range this season. That is a career high, and he is propelling the Clippers towards the playoffs. They are 9-1 in the last 10 games. They added a veteran center, Boogie Cousins, in free agency a few weeks ago. He's been on record saying that the, the hate against Paul George or the slander needs to stop. They are definitely making a great case for that. We're going to take a quick break, and when we get back, we're going to jump right into your Sacramento Kings week cap. Damian Jones back to Harrison Barnes. Shot clock down to six. Buddy, three. Welcome back to the Royal Report. It's time for your Sacramento Kings week cap. Great news to report this week for the Kings. They were above 500 for the week. They went two and one with wins over the Dallas Mavericks on Sunday and a win on Wednesday over the Minnesota Timberwolves in a bit of a revenge game after losing to the T-Wolves the night before. Barry, my biggest takeaways from the games this week were uh, a lot of the same in terms of the style of play out of the Kings, but they had some really good offensive performances that they were able to ride this week through to victories. Terrence Davis came up huge off the bench for the Kings uh, in that game against Dallas on Sunday. And it is uh, very well known now, the Kings are on record themselves having said it, that the fans in the stands gave them a really huge uh, boost, a big morale lift, and uh, they're excited to go out and play again. And I think that translated into two pretty exciting games themselves against the Timberwolves on Tuesday and Wednesday. Yeah, the, the Mavericks game was uh, kind of a typical Sacramento game. Uh, however, they were able to pull it out at the end there. You know, they, they had a really slow start. They started out two for 11 from three point range. Um, in Doncic had a crazy, insane fourth quarter. He was on fire. The Kings were able to still move past that with help from Terrence Davis. I know he went five for five from three point range, 23 points, a big boost for them and we were finally able to get another victory against the Dallas Mavericks and finally quiet that number two, supposed, should have been number two overall pick in Luka Doncic. So happy to see that. Two games against the Timberwolves, back to back. Lost the first game, 134 points given up. The Sacramento Kings just simply were not ready for that game. And you know, Unfortunate as it is, the Minnesota Timberwolves, uh, Timberwolves only have 16 wins this season, and unfortunately two of them came against your Sacramento Kings and in the past, you know, just two or three weeks. So tough to see that there. They were able to rebound. Luke Walton did make some adjustments, and the team was able to rebound on Wednesday night, um, beating the Minnesota Timberwolves led by an amazing first quarter, 44 points for the Kings in the first quarter, 30 points for De'Aaron Fox, 29 points for uh, Buddy Heald, and 22 for Harrison Barnes. It was an offensive uh, battle between these two teams. The Kings gave up over 120 points again. However, they were able to pull it out on the excellent shooting by Buddy Heald. As I mentioned, 29 points. He had a go-ahead three late in the game, and De'Aaron Fox was able to hit two clutch free throws to seal the game. I don't know the last time I said that, but it doesn't seem like it happens very often. I know Calvin and I have both been uh, very critical of De'Aaron and his free throw struggles, so I, for one, was very happy to see him hit those clutch free throws late in the game. Happy to see two more wins this week. The Sacramento Kings finished two and one. Oh, what a sigh of relief. Right, life is good, life is good. 
And uh, yeah, I mean, it's pretty remarkable that Dallas game, De'Aaron Fox and Buddy Heald go combine 0 for 6 from 3, and yet the Kings as a team still shoot 45% from 3 for the game. <laughs> that, that is really amazing. And mar much of the reason why they were able to pull that game out, you mentioned the, the great performance by Luka. He really didn't have much help uh, from any, anybody else on the Mavericks. So the Kings were able to get that win, and they didn't even give up 120 points in that game, if you can believe that. And then, yeah, they, they got some really great offensive performances all around the whole week. Uh, anytime that you have Fox, Barnes, Barnes, and Buddy Heald all scoring 20 plus points in a game, Sacramento is going to be a really tough out. Doesn't matter who they're playing or how many points they're giving up either. Yeah, and you know, honestly, it kind of shows uh, what happens with Buddy Heald, right? You know, he's not very defensive oriented, he's a shooter, shooter, shoot. They were able to luckily outscore the Timberwolves in that second game, but unfortunately, if Buddy Heald had played his, his normal self, the Kings probably would have lost that game. So, you know, kind of some mixed emotions there. I also wanted to mention that, that these are the first two games the Kings have won without Rashawn Holmes. So, big news there. I know we had talked about it last week. The Kings were 0-6 without Rashawn. So, finally, a couple victories. We're gonna take a quick break and we'll be right back. Back comes HB, nice lead for Jones with the two-handed punch. Welcome back. Kings fans, it's time to take a trip down memory lane. This week marked the 70th anniversary of the only professional championship in Kings franchise history. April 21st, 1951, the Rochester Royals won the National Basketball League championship defeating the New York Knicks in Game 7 of the final series. Barry, after the season the Kings have had, it feels awfully good to have something to celebrate, does it not? It feels so good. Kings fans, make sure you grab your Jester juice. Calvin and I have been celebrating all week long. If the Lakers can claim five titles in Minnesota, then we can claim one in New York. And what a series it was. As you mentioned, seven games. New York team versus New York team. The Rochester Royals were able to beat the Knicks in seven games. They won the first three, the Knicks won the next three and were able to push it to seven and the Royals were able to finally come out with that elusive title. Pretty, pretty amazing. The star of that team, Bob Davies, actually the oldest player on that team at 31 years old it's pretty amazing to think about considering the finals mvp and last year's finals i think is like 30 36 or 37 already so crazy there but he is actually the only player on that team that the kings retired his number number 11 and you know as many of you might know george mccann a famous laker his younger brother ed mccann was on that team uh, that royals team for the start of the season before being shipped over to the capitals um, but it is a title that the kings are hanging from the banners i'm happy to celebrate and uh let's leave it at that that's right for those of you who don't know the rochester royals were actually named in part from the Whiskey Crown Royal. So, to celebrate the 70th anniversary, pour yourself a crown. We'll be right back. Injury, injury, injury. Kings holding a five point lead. Harrison Barnes, oh, Harrison Patrick. Oh. Welcome back, Kings fans. We are trying out a new segment on uh, this week's show called Kings Fair or Foul. Calvin and I will discuss a controversial statement and decide on whether that statement is fair or foul. You ready to go, Cal? Let's do it. Okay, first one, here we go. Marvin Bagley is worth the number two pick. I'm gonna go with foul on this one. Uh, unfortunately, Marvin hasn't been healthy for a good portion of his career thus far, and that is definitely not his fault, nor should we hold it against him. But when he has been on the court, his numbers I just don't warrant to me the number two overall pick. His numbers this year are actually very similar to Wendell Carter's numbers, uh, who was the seventh overall pick in that same draft. Carter was just uh, shipped out of Chicago to the Orlando Magic for not living up to those high draft pick expectations. 
and I, I just don't think that Marvin has lived up to those expectations as well. So I will say foul. I am also going to say foul. Um, and that's just based on the fact that I don't think many players are, are really worth that number two pick. Um, you know, you have the first and second pick. Those are obviously going to be your, your best two players in each draft class. And, you know, you, there's 60 players that are getting drafted. It's hard to tell who is actually going to be the best in that class um, when you're ranking position, skill set, uh, fit, need. All that information um, goes into that calculation. And I just feel that there aren't many people that are actually, uh, you know, worth that pick. Uh, Kevin Durant is a guy that comes to mind for me. I know he probably should have been the number one overall pick that year, um, went to Greg Oden instead. But when I'm looking at a number two overall pick, he's worth it to me if he is a franchise changing player. And Marvin simply has not done that for the Sacramento Kings. Yeah, and it certainly doesn't help when you uh, have a player who's drafted immediately behind you who certainly looks like they're going to be one of the better players, not only in that draft class, but maybe in the entire league. Obviously, Sam Bowie was picked number two right, and had a, right ahead of Michael Jordan, and we all know how that ended. Um, Luka Doncic and Marvin Bagley, the same thing. So that definitely doesn't help Marvin's case. But moving on, Buddy Heald needs to go from the Sacramento Kings. Barry, fair or foul? I am going to go fair with this one. Um, you know, nothing, I don't want to take anything away from Buddy. His shooting percentage, his numbers have been incredible. Um, the records that he's setting, great offensive player, a little streaky at times, not always consistent. But the reason I'm, I'm going to trade Buddy is, is because of the defensive end of the floor. I think that defense is uh, more important now than ever. I feel that every player has to be able to contribute. Uh, it's a lot harder to hide players on defense, um, you know, with, with all these skilled players that are in the league. So I need five guys that are tall, that are lanky, that can shoot, that can switch on defense. That, that's who I want on my team. So I, I'm trading Buddy Heald, unfortunately. I agree with everything that you just said. However, one part that I'm hung up on is what you're mentioning about the trade. Obviously, the only way Buddy Heald is leaving Sacramento is if he's traded. And do I think that he will be traded? I will say foul. And the reason for that is his sporadic play combined with his new contract and the amount of money that he makes, I think is scaring teams off from making a deal for him. He didn't get dealt at the trade deadline, even though there were a lot of rumors uh, surrounding his name. I don't see there being a team in the offseason who's going to come in with a new deal for him. Uh, as we mentioned, it's just too inconsistent offensively, doesn't play any defense, um, and he makes a lot of money as well. So I, I don't think that he will be traded. All right, next one here. The Sacramento Kings will make the playoffs within the next three years. Call me a crazy Kings fan but I'm going fair on this one. And the biggest reason for that is the new front office in Sacramento. I think this is a group that's gonna draft very well. We've already seen that with Tyrese Halliburton, who did admittingly fall into their laps, but they still had to make the call to take him when they already had a, a budding star point guard in De'Aaron Fox, and it's worked out very well for them. I think they're gonna to continue to make smart roster moves in the future, not just in the draft, but in free agency, financially responsible moves as well. This year's draft class is loaded, particularly in the top 10, which is probably where the Kings are going to be picking. So whether they take a player with that pick or they trade that pick for some more assets, I think that they're gonna be making the right moves and they're gonna find a winning formula within the next three seasons. I am also gonna go fair with that statement. I agree with everything you just said, um, but I am going to go with the law of averages on this one. I feel like uh, you can only be bad for so long. Uh, there's a famous statement, you know, uh, even a blind squirrel finds a nut. So uh, even the Sacramento Kings can make it to the playoffs. I definitely think it'll happen. I think the team is trending in the right direction. 
Maybe not this season, but in the overall picture, I'm happy with the new front office, the players they're bringing in, the culture they're building. Yes, the Kings will make the playoffs within the next three seasons. That's right, go Kings. All right, our last statement here on fair or foul, a very controversial one indeed, is, or sorry, De'Aaron Fox rather, is a top five point guard in the NBA, fair or foul, Barry? Oh man, well, many of you already know that I am a crazy Kings fan, <laughs> so I am going to say fair. De'Aaron Fox is well on his way to becoming a top point guard in this league. Currently, I think he is just around five or six. I'm gonna give him that fifth spot. But it really depends on uh, what you classify as a point guard. There's a lot of hybrid guys in this uh, situation. Luka Doncic, uh, LeBron James, Ben Simmons, uh, guys like that that are not traditional point guards, yet they do take the bulk of the ball handling responsibility for their team. Uh, we used to call them point forwards. However, with um, the size of players in this league and, and people getting bigger, uh, many of those players have been moved to that point guard position. So if I'm not counting any of those hybrid guys, I am saying yes, De'Aaron Fox is a top five point guard in the NBA. All right, before you, all you Kings fans out there at me with this answer, I want you to hear me out. I am gonna say foul on this one. De'Aaron Fox is very, very close to being a top five point guard. He is definitely in my top six or seven point guards in the NBA, and he's only 23, so there is plenty of time for him to get there. However, when you look at the list of point guards in this league, there are some great ones. There are five that I currently have ahead of him. That would be Russell Westbrook, Kyrie Irving, Steph Curry, Damian Lillard, and Chris Paul. Jamal Murray is also very, very close this is a very, very tough list to crack into in the, in the top five point guards in the league. However, if De'Aaron continues to improve at the rate that he has so far in his career, he should be a top five point guard very, very soon. If you guys want to send some uh, hate mail to Calvin, his address is uh, 77 Halalo Street, Lahaina, Hawaii, 96761. Thanks for joining us on this topic. We're gonna take a quick break and when we get back, we have an exciting surprise for you. We have a guest host joining the show. Sackdown Pete will be here discussing Deer and Fox when we get back. Welcome back everyone. As Barry mentioned before we cut to break, we have a very special guest joining us here on the Royal Report. None other than Sacktown Pete, who is a very, very loyal Kings fan himself. He covers the Sacramento Kings with his own YouTube channel and we couldn't be happier to have him on the show. Thanks for joining us, Pete. Yeah, what's up, Pete? Thanks for joining us. Uh, to all you viewers out there, you can usually find Pete down in the comments. I'm also gonna put a link to his Twitter and his YouTube channel in the description of this video. He is a very, very loyal Kings fan. You'll find him on YouTube after pretty much every single Kings game, breaking it down, talking to all the fans. So Pete, welcome to the show. Thank you, Calvin. Thank you, Barry, for having me on. What is going on, everybody? My name is Sacktown Pete. It's an honor and pleasure to be on this week's episode. Um, I wanna talk about De'Aaron Fox's development, especially this season, into a turning into a star. Um, despite the Sacramento Kings bipolar season that they are having this season, there has been some bright spots. Um, De'Aaron Fox has step, taken a step to stardom this season. He's averaging 25 points a game, seven assists, three rebounds, and shooting 47% from the field goal. Um, I have nothing but great things to say about De'Aaron Fox's development. Um, he is shooting the ball with confidence. He is on the block, posting up other point guards on the block. Uh, we know about his speed. It seems like every season he's getting faster and faster. And now with the bald head and not with the afro, it seems like he's more aerodynamic now. But I'm not gonna, I'm, I am gonna say this. Uh, I do miss ha him having the afro. I will say that. And I get the frustration. Um, the last two, three weeks, I've seen the post games of De'Aaron Fox. 
especially during the losing streak, and he wants to win. Um, I really feel like De'Aaron Fox is being already compared to the other Sacramento era point guards uh, when he talk about as being one of the best point guards in this franchise era. Reggie Diaz, uh, Mike Bibby, Spud Webb, and Jason Williams. And De'Aaron Fox career stat and season numbers are amongst better than those sack era point guards that I've mentioned. And this is why I really do believe that De'Aaron Fox is going to become not just a star, but he will become a superstar based on the season and what I've seen. And we're excited. We're thrilled to have him. We are grateful and fortunate to draft him in the 2017 NBA draft. And yeah, uh, I think I see nothing but great things uh, for De'Aaron Fox ahead. Thanks, Pete. Yeah, that's a fantastic answer. We've certainly enjoyed watching De'Aaron Fox play this season, just like every Kings fan has. I'm curious to know what you think are the areas that he needs to improve upon the most before he is a legitimate bona fide superstar. Yeah, and that's a great question. Um, I think that De'Aaron Fox, to what he needs to do to improve you know, on becoming the superstar is his free throw shooting. Considering the fact that he's a point guard and most point guards in the league are good free throw shooters, uh, that's basically what he has to do is improve his free throw shooting. In order for him to take that next step in his development, he has to become a better free throw shooter. Um, I want to see next season in particular, uh, the jump from 71% to close to 80%. And let's face it, I mean, if you look back at his rookie season, he had uncontrollable speed. Um, there's been times where his rookie year, he just was too playing at a faster, he's just playing ahead of himself. And, you know, the year two, the game slowed down for him. He controlled his speed. He even had a big leap in year two compared to year one. And year three last season, he's made another tremendous amount of leap of attacking the rim, being aggressive, and drawing the fouls. Um, and we've seen that this year in particular where he's, you know, going 100 miles per hour, hard to the rack, and drawing the uh, contact and drawing fouls. So it's just, it's great to see him develop and continue to develop. And the scary thing about it, he's still only 23 years old. Can De'Aaron Fox and Tyrese Halliburton thrive together? I know they're both at the same position in point guard. We've seen a few other teams in the league have been successful, but do you think the Kings will be successful starting two point guards? That's an, again, Barry, that's a great question. The Sacramento Kings can become successful with De'Aaron Fox and Tyrese Halliburton. The draft room, if you guys remember back uh, during the draft of last season, uh, they were all, you know, excited, you know, jumping up and down when Tyrese Halliburton was available to the Sacramento Kings at 12 because they know um, today's league in this day and age, this era that we're best playing basketball in, uh, it's a guard-driven league. You got to have multiple guards uh, to be really good and be really, really relevant in this league. Um, you, you talk about Steph and Clay. You talk about Dame and CJ in Portland. Um, Trey Young, Bogdanovich, they're balling out this year in Atlanta. Um, Tyrese Halliburton is a perfect fit next to De'Aaron Fox. He can spread the floor. He can shoot. He can play defense alongside De'Aaron Fox. He's long and lengthy. He has a, such a high IQ, and he has facilitated, and he has uh, destroyed defenses. Um, you know, In particular, there's that game against the San Antonio Spurs uh, that we pulled away and won. And that whole fourth quarter, Tyrese Halliburton took over. Um, him and Rashad Holmes, they worked the pick and roll, and he just destroyed defenses with his playmaking ability, whether it's lobbing the ball up to Rashad Holmes or dishing it out to shooters, or just whether he's going himself uh, up with it, with the layup or a floater, or pulling up for a jump shot. Tyree, Tyrese Halliburton and De'Aaron Fox are a match made in heaven, and I think that ultimately, I really do believe that they're going to be one of the best uh, duos in the league. All right. Thank you so much, Pete. We enjoyed having you on the show. I did want to mention real quick that De'Aaron Fox is leading the NBA in fourth quarter scoring. Very happy to see that. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. Thanks, Pete. One for one. As Tyrese decides to keep that one for himself. What's up guys? Welcome back. 
On the topic of pairing De'Aaron Fox and another point guard, um, Tyrese Halliburton, and starting them both together, that brings us into our next section where we are talking about Tyrese Halliburton and his chances at the Rookie of the Year award. I know many of us Kings fans were very hopeful, uh, you know, a few months ago as, as he was one and two with uh, LaMelo Ball and the Rookie of the Year ladder and obviously LaMelo was injured and many Kings fans were, were delighted with the possibility that Halliburton could move into that number one spot. But over the past few weeks, he has regressed. Unfortunately, he is sitting uh, number four now in the rookie rankings. Calvin, how are you feeling about Tyrese? Well, I still feel great about him. I mean, let's be clear, whether or not Tyrese Halliburton wins Rookie of the Year is certainly not going to be the, uh, the grading scale that I'm going to use to determine whether he was a good pick for Sacramento or whether he's a valuable asset to this team or whether he's a huge part of their future going forward. I think the answer to all of those questions is well, an outstanding yes, um, regardless of that Rookie of the Year award. What it comes down to, to me, is simple wear and tear. You know, I think a guy like Tyrese, who is incredibly skilled, um, you know, a lot of players come from college to the NBA and they have to make a big adjustment of playing, not just an 82 game schedule, but a packed 82 game schedule, even though it's only 72 this year. That's still exponentially more than anybody plays at any point in their life before they get to the NBA. And not only that, you're going up against full grown men who are the best athletes in the world night in and night out. It's a very grueling process to make it through an entire NBA season, even for somebody who's in their early 20s um, or mid 20s. So, and, and when you look at the, the rookie of the year race currently, Anthony Edwards has kind of cemented himself right now, in my opinion, as the number one guy to win that award. His body was much more NBA ready than Tyrese's coming into this season, and I think that's had, that's given Anthony an ability um, to continue to play at a high level night in and night out. You know, there are other factors that go into that too. Certainly the, the team you play on, the competition level, um, all of that stuff. When you have a, a star like De'Aaron Fox who's going to have the ball in his hands, Tyrese is going to have nights where he just doesn't put up big numbers because you know, for whatever reason, De'Aaron's on fire or Buddy Heald is going seven for 11 from three and Tyrese is impacting the game in other ways. But I, I think he's really just adjusting to the physical wear and tear that the, the NBA regular season poses on you. Yeah, I completely agree with you. You know, Tyrese has played 53 games this year. He only played 57 games in two years in college. So that right there goes to show uh, the amount of extra wear and tear that's been on his body this year. And, you know, luckily for him and for many Kings fans is, is he's been, been really healthy this year. I know he missed a game with a wrist injury, um, but, you know, he's been available. Like I said, 53 games this year, that is a lot on, on a young body. So he's learning, he's gonna continue to condition himself to get stronger, his body will get stronger, and I anticipate him to be available and, and ready next year to play through that entire year. So for me, I agree with you, wear and tear, um, the length of the season has definitely drawn on him and, and that's kind of why his numbers have, have you know, been on the decline over the past few weeks. But another thing that I wanted to mention is, you know, you said number one right now is Edwards. Edwards' game is just a more flashy game. Obviously, he's a scorer, 18 points a game right now. He, I feel like the rookie of the year and the MVP race are, are kind of more weighted towards those type of play styles. When you look at a guy like, like Tyrese Halliburton, you know, Tyrese, can do so many different things on the court that sometimes that overshadows aspects of his game. Uh, the Sacramento Kings released a, a documentary um, this week on you know the making of Tyrese Halliburton. Awesome thing. Check it out on YouTube if, if you're if you're interested. But you know they broke it down into Tyrese Halliburton's not a scorer. He doesn't like to score. He may be a, a wonderful three-point shooter and great at getting the basket and all that stuff. 
but, but he's an assist guy. He loves to pass the ball, he loves to set up his teammates, and he loves to make the right play. It kind of reminds me of a MVP caliber player who just won finals MVP last year in LeBron James. Um, very well-rounded game. It's crazy that, that we're even talking about you know LeBron as, as not a scorer when he could ultimately end up with the scoring record in the entire NBA. But I see Tyrese as a, a similar player with LeBron in, in the terms of he loves to set up his teammates, he loves to pass the ball, and unfortunately, he's gonna get snubbed on things like Rookie of the Year, All-Star votes, MVP awards, stuff like that, just based on the fact that he loves to set up other people. So that right there, I'm not gonna be super uh, disappointed if Tyrese doesn't win Rookie of the Year, but you look at his numbers, he's having a, an incredible season. He's third in the league in points per game, second in the league in assists, second in the league in steals, efficiency, and three-point percentage. So he is absolutely balling. Those are all rookie oh, numbers, rookies, by yeah. the way. <laughs> but yes, he is absolutely balling out. And, you know, happy to have him on the Sacramento Kings. Without a doubt. And I think it also, um, you know, we would be doing all the rookies in the league this year a disservice if we didn't mention that it's been probably more difficult for this class of rookies than it has for maybe any other class. That you, When you think about everything that's going on in the world, um, COVID has affected the NBA just like it's affected everything on every level. They didn't have a real training camp. They didn't have the scouting combine. They didn't have a lot of things that the mental um, drain uh, you know from not being able to see your families and COVID restrictions I'm sure plays a, a large part in some rookie struggles ups and downs throughout the course of the season as well so speaking of uh, COVID struggles and stuff like that the Sacramento Kings have been impacted financially as many other businesses have and we're gonna jump right into that when we come back nowadays we all know that cash rules everything around us cream get the money dollar dollar bill y'all welcome back to the royal report you know it's tax season so barry and i thought that we would take a, an in-depth look at the financial statements for the sacramento kings in all seriousness we decided to make this a category this week because we received an influx of questions for our cowbell question segment in fact we received more questions than we ever have before on any other show we wanted to make sure that we showed our appreciation to all of our viewers out there and tried to make enough time to answer all those questions. That being said, one of our faithful viewers out there who goes by the ad name 2, T-O-O, submitted a bunch of questions regarding the King's current financial situation. He wanted to know things like what the Sacramento King's attendance was last year before COVID hit, what the Forbes value of the franchise is listed at, and what current owner Vivek Ranadive paid to buy the Kings way back when. Barry, let's take a shot at giving two of the answers to these questions here. All right, I'll try my best here. Thank you, too. Thank you so much uh, to everyone out there for all your questions. Uh, we're Sacramento Kings fans to the heart. We'd love to hear from you guys. So uh, this brings us to the Kings. They possibly could be in another financial issue. I know the last time any Kings fans discussed this topic was back in 2013 when they were with the Maloofs and they were about to move out of town to Seattle. They were saved by Sacramento mayor at the time, Kevin Johnson, and a private equity group led by Vivek Ranadive. The Sacramento Kings were purchased in 2013 or 65% of the team actually was purchased, which gave the entire team a valuation of 534 million, which set a brand new record for sports franchises. It's crazy to think that that record has been broken a few times since then, but it is a, a truly astounding number. Fast forward to today, the Kings are uh, rated by Forbes or valued at $1.825 billion. That is a, a crazy number to even think about and a beautiful eight years of appreciation for that private equity group. Yet, we are here talking about financial ruin and financial trouble. 
Back in March, uh, it was reported by the Sacramento Bee that the Kings had lost over a hundred million dollars during the pandemic uh, with loss of fans, uh, TV revenue, um, all that stuff. And they ended up, or the Kings responded by laying off many uh, employees and a lot of uh, very long-term employees that had been with the team uh, for the past 10, 20 years or so. So that brings up many questions from fans and others around the league on, on whether the Kings are in financial trouble and what that could mean for us as a fan base. I know I, for one, am, am happy that they stayed in Sacramento and, and I would be completely devastated if they ever were sold and, and moved out of the city again. But, you know, I, I as a positive Kings fan, I, I don't think that will happen. I think that there are a ton of businesses that were impacted by COVID in all different uh, fields, all over the spectrum. And I think the Kings are, are in a pretty good position to, to bounce back. They did build a brand new arena just a few years ago and they probably have a large mortgage payment on that property and, and all those construction costs. Uh, there was um, a, a high up exec with the Kings that was busted for uh, stealing money from them and buying property down in the LA region just a few years ago. So they've, they've been through a, a few messes already. Um, but unfortunately, I think that it will lead to some less spending this offseason. I, I think that Luke Walton could potentially remain with the Kings uh, with them, you know, not willing to pay two coaches at a time. I think Luke Walton's still under contract for another two years. So I'm not really sure exactly how it's all going to pan out, but uh, Calvin, What's going to happen this offseason? Are, are the Kings going to be, be fire sailing everybody or, or just make some small calculated moves and, and try and save a few dollars? I, I would expect them to do the latter of those two uh, as opposed to a fire sale. They've already got, uh, as of right now, a, a decent amount of cap space available. So there's no necessary need to get rid of, of more players unless you're getting something of good value in return. And like you said, there's just a lot of hurdles left to clear before not just the Kings, but every business in this country gets back to doing business as normal. You know, I think the biggest thing that all NBA franchises can hope for right now is at the start of next season, they'll be able to have a full capacity crowd for every home game. That would be definitely the, the quickest fix that, that an NBA franchise could get in this short amount of time. As far as this offseason goes, lots of questions. There, you really don't know which way it's gonna break down and, and it all starts really with the draft. I think after the draft, you'll have a, a better idea of which direction the Kings are gonna be heading. And you know, speaking of attendance, that, that is a bright spot for the Kings. Uh, on their balance sheet, fans were welcomed back on Wednesday. I know it was only 3,500 fans. Um, but it was the first time that they were welcomed back in the building since that March 11th game in 2020 uh, that was postponed and, and the entire NBA season ended up being postponed from that point on. But before that had happened, the Kings, you know, were averaging 17,000 fans a game. They ranked 20th in the NBA. I know that's, uh, that's not great, but, you know, two-thirds of the NBA, it, I'm happy to be in that. So... I think the Kings will, will come out of this okay. We might see uh, some moves fueled by uh, some penny pinching this off season, but ultimately I think the Kings will remain in Sacramento. I think the Kings will remain in Golden One Center and I think Vivek will remain the majority owner of the Sacramento Kings. Well said. Thanks again too for your uh, very in-depth questions. I hope we answered those uh, to the best of our ability for you. When we come back though, it's time for more questions. We'll ring that bell. We'll be right back. Guess what? I got a fever. And the only prescription is more cowbell. Welcome back. We're ringing the bell. It's cowbell question time. We're very excited to bring you cowbell questions this week. As I mentioned before, thank you guys so much for all your submissions. This week, it really was a big boost for us uh, to, to hear that, that people want to have their questions answered on the show, and we're gonna give it to you. So without further ado, let's get our first question from the announcer. If the Kings move on from Luke Walton, 
who should they target? Well, I think many Kings fans don't believe it's an if question, but a when question. I uh, happen to agree with those fans. I think that Luke Walton will be fired. I'm not sure exactly when it will be, if it's this season or next season. But I think uh, he will depart, and I don't think he will remain with the Kings when they make the playoffs in the next three years, as we predicted. As far as uh, um, some candidates that could fill his position, Calvin and I had talked about um, Mark Jackson on the show before. He, you know, set up that culture with Golden State before they were taken over by Steve Kerr and, and turned into a dynasty. So I, for one, would be very happy with Mark Jackson. I would also be open to bringing Dave Yeager back. I know many Kings fans had talked about Dave and and wanting him to be back. The Kings had their best season in many years with Dave at the helm, and there had been some friction with Dave and a few guys in the organization over the drafting of Marvin Bagley. Um, but you know, Marvin could not be on the team next year. Uh, many, many executives on the team could not be with the team next year. Vlade Divox is already gone. So I, I could see a situation where, where Dave Yeager ends up returning to this team. But the ultimate guy that I'm really looking at would be Mike D'Antoni. I know a lot of people hate on Mike because he doesn't play defense and all that stuff, but guess what? The Kings don't play defense either. <laughs> if I were to think of the perfect coach to unlock De'Aaron Fox and, and create a superstar out of him, Mike is the only one that comes to my mind. He has the offensive IQ and he is the only guy that can scheme for any player in the league, and we see what, what he did with James Harden, I think that he would be the guy that could send De'Aaron to that next level. Yeah, those are, are all good picks. I'm gonna go a little bit of a different route. I, I want a more defensive-minded coach in place. I think that's the, the one thing that the Kings need to, to make it over the, the playoff hump. So uh, Mark Jackson certainly is somebody that comes to mind. We've already mentioned him on the show before. Jeff Van Gundy is another guy that I think uh, could get some recognition here. He's a very defensive-minded, defensive-first kind of coach. He's a little bit old school. I could see him having a similar effect on Sacramento like Tom Thibodeau has had on a young New York Knicks team this year. Um, and then my third person, I'm not sure he's going to be available because he is currently having a great run with the Atlanta Hawks, but Nate McMillan was an assistant to begin the season there, and he has now taken over the interim head coach after they fired uh, their previous head coach. If he somehow doesn't sign a contract to be the head coach full-time with Atlanta next year, I think the Kings should definitely make a huge push for him. We're gonna go right on to our next question. Who is the Kings' best defender? This was a tough one for me, De'Aaron Fox, is by far the best all-around player on this team, and he is a great defender. But I am gonna actually say Harrison Barnes is the best individual defender on this team, and the reason for that is that Harrison is a great defender in his own right, and unlike De'Aaron, he actually can guard positions one through four. He guards guys like LeBron James one night, and he'll guard a, a small guard the following night. De'Aaron is not at that level yet. So to me, Harrison Barnes provides more defensive versatility for this team than De'Aaron Fox does. That's an interesting answer, Calvin. Uh, you know, Harrison Barnes kind of reminds me of, of the old dude at the gym that doesn't wear deodorant and he's all on your face and sweating on you. He, he can guard, you know, pretty much four positions and he's, he's a big physical guy that's, that's hard to move. Um, but I'm going to go potential here. I'm going to go with the best player. I'm going to go De'Aaron Fox. I, I think that De'Aaron, um, I think his offensive game has, has overshadowed uh, what he does on the defensive end of the floor. And I think that being a guy that has the energy to run up and down the court like he does on offense and still be a, a, you know, a very, very good defender and active defender on the defensive end, uh, I got to go with Fox with this one. Yeah, it's, it's really hard not to agree with you on that one, but next question. If the Kings draft Jalen Suggs or Cade Cunningham, will they trade De'Aaron Fox? Well, I don't think there's such a thing as a stupid question. However, I don't think the Kings are going to draft either of these players. 
First off, I think the Kings would have to win the draft lottery to even have a shot at either of these players. And if they did, I think they would more likely draft Evan Mobley, big man out of USC, or end up trading that draft pick for a guy like a Bradley Beal. Yeah, I agree with you. I don't see a scenario where the Kings would draft either Cade Cunningham or Jalen Suggs, as crazy as it might sound, but their backcourt is fully loaded already. They're just not in a position where they need either of those players. If they are high enough in the draft to take a guy like Cade Cunningham, who is considered to be by most the number one overall pick, I would definitely think it would make a lot more sense to take Evan Mobley, a guy who could fill in uh, as a big man right away in the starting lineup for the Kings. So De'Aaron Fox, in short, is not leaving this team. Uh, also for Jalen Suggs, I would much uh, rather see the Kings trade out of that spot if they were in a position to take him where they could flip that pick for a couple other first round picks or some players that could contribute right away. They just don't need another point guard in this crowded backcourt already. But that is all the time we have for questions. Ring that bell. Thank you guys so much, as we mentioned before, for your submissions. Our questions this week came to us from Tanvir Atwal. Look over there and two, and we wanna say a very special thank you guys for your submissions. If you have a question that you'd like us to answer on next week's show, you know the drill, submit it in the comment section below, hashtag it cowbell questions, and we'll be right back to wrap up the show. Thank you guys so much for your questions. Thank you all for joining us on this week's episode of the Royal Report. We have three awesome games coming up this week. The Kings take on the Golden State Warriors, the Dallas Mavericks, and the league best Utah Jazz. Calvin, what game are you most excited to watch this week? I'm excited to see them all. It's a good test this week for the Sacramento Kings. A lot of good competition going up against the league's best Utah Jazz, a team that the Kings almost beat just a couple weeks ago. Of course, I always love watching Steph Curry play when he is cooking like he is right now. It'll be another good test for Sacramento as well. And we get to see them try to get another win against our arch nemesis, Luka Doncic. So excited for all these games this week. A few shout outs that we want to mention on today's show. First of all, Sacktown Pete, shout out. Thank you so much thank for you, being Pete. our guest on the show this week. We really, really enjoyed having you and thank you for your input. Shout out to Lindsey Harding. Lindsay was an assistant coach for the Sacramento Kings since 2019. She's a pioneer in the sport as well. With the 76ers, she became the first female black lead scout in NBA history. And Lindsay has now accepted a job to be a head coach of a team in South Sudan. We wish her the best of luck. Also, shout out Harry Giles, our former Sacramento Kings team member, had his 23rd birthday this week, and we hope he had a very happy birthday indeed. Happy birthday, Harry. And I also don't want to forget my last shout out. It goes out to you, Kings fans. Thank you so much for watching the show. You guys all make this possible. If you do enjoy this content, make sure you hit that like and subscribe button. Uh, put a question down below for cowbell questions and we will see you all next week. Go Kings. Go Kings. Thanks guys.